Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's original series, Watchmen. Season one, episode two, entitled Martial Feats of Comanche Horsemanship. What a wonderful game changing episode. So many details, so many Easter egg drops that it's ridiculous. We'll have the recap and the review. That's all coming up next. <laughs> It's Bunny. <laughs> One thing that I want the viewers to understand while watching this series, before I get into the description of the first scene, is please allow yourself to learn and grow with the series as it continues, perfect example, with the first episode, I made sure to not say certain names or who's who, but announce the names as we learn and watch the episode. It's one thing to Google and go on IDMB and look at the actors and see who they're playing, but what is the suspense in that? What is the excitement in that if you do that? Grow with the series. You've done it before. You've done it with the Game of Thrones. You've done it with The Handmaid's Tale. You've done it with Hulu's original series, Wu-Tang Clan. I could go on and on and on. That is what I want you to understand. Now, for those that have read the comic books, such as myself, I can make some pretty accurate estimates of who's who. But this series is a remix of certain characters taken from this DC comic. So please allow yourself to do that. With Game of Thrones, we were introduced to so many people in episode one, season one, that a lot of us were like confused and, and didn't know what the hell was going on. But as it continued, we knew, hmm, who is this woman with this long hair, with this very spiteful attitude? And then we hear in the episode, oh yes, Queen Cersei. And we said, oh, so that's who she is. So I will do the same thing with the review of this series. Learn, be patient, and allow this series to take you on the journey. Let the writers wow and surprise you. Because if you allowed it to do that, this episode had a lot of shockers and it gave you excitement, okay? Do you agree to do that? Be patient, I know you're anxious. Remember, there are newbies to this whole new experience. Not everybody has read the comic books. Not everyone has seen the movie. So let's try not to so much spoiler alert and put so much detail in the comments because that will spoil the excitement of the show. All right? All right, now let's get to the first scene. The opening scene, we see a room full of women transcribers typing messages on typewriters. And as they're typing, a man enters the room and says, which one of you are full on Beulah? And a woman raises her hand, identifies herself. He confirms if she can translate something and type English. And she says yes. And then he tells her to come into his office and to bring her typewriter. They go into the office. He kicks up his feet and starts to smoke his pipe. And he sits back and he begins to give her a message and says, Hello, boys. What are you doing here? Are you fighting the Germans? A message telling you that you must wipe us out for the sake of humanity, for the sake of democracy. What is democracy? And this message goes on to describe that you are fighting a war for a country that could care less about you. And after this war, you won't even be treated fairly. But yet here, many people of color are very prosperous in Berlin. So these messages are falling over black soldiers' heads as they are fighting for 
America. And these are true events and true things that happen with black soldiers. But with American history, they want you to think that it was nothing but lily white <laughs> fighters over there for the sake of America. But there were many people of color and different ethnicities fighting for America. This reference is also mentioned in the movie Miracle on St. Saint Anna, directed by Spike Lee, of these true events. But I love how they're dropping real events that happen in real life in this series. But moving on, one of the soldiers who collects one of those messages, he's reading it and trying very hard not for it to dissuade his thoughts. And we see him in a room getting dressed for battle and we see a little boy that has that mole indication on the side of his face. So we know that that is a reference of who this little boy is and he's looking at the message and the father swipes it out of his hand as to let him know, don't read that. But then we go back to present day with this old man who's reflecting back at that moment. And we see he has that same mold. So we know as the viewer that that was the young child with his father in that moment as he dressed for battle. And it's the same scene that we left ending with episode one, with him in the wheelchair, with Angela pulling up in the Jeep and him having the flashlight and shining it in her face to where Angela can see Judd hanging from a tree. Angela has so much going through her mind in this moment that she thinks clear enough that she has to remove this old man from this scene because she doesn't know what just happened. She takes him to the bakery, she sits him outside of that area, looks into his pockets to see what he has and sees that he has this bottle of pills and she sits it to the side. And there is a cinematic emphasis on these pills but she puts it to the side and she starts the coffee maker to make him some coffee she goes back into the back room the coded room and starts to collect her thoughts so much and she's so angry and she shakes a gate and she's upset and crying but all of a sudden she recollects herself and she suits up she comes back out of the room, and by the time she comes out, the coffee is ready. She gets the pills, and she hands it to him. He takes the pill, and we notice that he gulps down the steaming, piping hot coffee like it's just a cool glass of water. And she sees that, and Angela gives that side eye to think, did he just gulp down that steaming hot coffee? But she snaps out of it, and she says, who are you? And he tells her that I'm the man that hung up your chief from that tree. She says, well, you're 100 years old. How in the world did you get that man up there and you're in the wheelchair? And he says, well, correction, I'm 105 years old. And I did hang up your chief from that tree. She looks at him and says, okay, you did it. How? He says, well, Dr. Manhattan helped me. She doesn't believe it because she tells him, um, you know, Dr. Manhattan is on Mars. So we see this relax of body language, like, okay, clearly this guy's cuckoo. And, you know, I'll just keep him here because he's clearly lost his mind. And he tells her that your chief has a lot of skeletons in his closet. And she continues to look at him in doubt and says, well, what kind of skeletons? And he says, there's so much about the rebellion, there's so much detail about what people are hiding. If I even began to tell you right now, your head would explode. There's just so much you don't know. Skeletons in the closet, details about the rebellion. And she says, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He said, I just told you, but you don't listen. She's so frustrated that she leaves him there and she takes the cup that he just drank out of and puts it in a plastic bag. And when a cop puts something in a plastic bag, we can assume that she's taking it somewhere for DNA analysis. He tells her, my name is Will, but who are you? So we know the gentleman's name in the wheelchair is Will. And we can put that in a mental note of who he is. But he's questioning her, who are you? Before she leaves, she does get a call. And with that call, her reaction is, oh no. I'm, I'm on my way. So we know that she's receiving news, but she doesn't want to let her department know that she already knows this information. So she proceeds to leave. 
are two gentlemen that are talking at a newsstand and we see that the headliner of a newspaper reads squid fall baffles scientists so we know that they're researching what is this weird squid fall like rain s that's going on so even the scientists don't know but as the guys are talking shout out to the actor from the, the wire but as they're talking they're saying man i don't trust this senator and i don't like that senator e either and they're having small talk talk and just chit-chatting but they put that excerpt in just to let the viewers know that even the scientists don't know what's going on with this this squid mess that's going on and they're still trying to figure out what's what we then see angela she's suited up and booted up in her car headed back towards the crime scene where they found judd and as she's trying to get there we got different people from the news and paparazzi people trying to get whatever little information that they can they let her in and as she gets closer to the crime scene, she does see some, oh, actually a lot of the masked cops that are over there trying to put two and two together, take pictures, and talk to one another. She parks her car, and then we see the gentleman get in with the, the, with the reflective mask, and he sits in her car. And before he sits down, he takes the cup that she's just retrieved, he, that she retrieved from Will, that was a mouthful, a lot of W's, and he sits it on the dash of the car and he sits there and says got anything to eat she tells him it's nuts in the glove compartment and he starts to eat it and ask her some questions so we got some information that last night he was with you and angela says what he says well he was with you having dinner right because i inquired about where he was she says well yeah did, did his wife seem to be a little high? And she goes, no. Well, what about Judd? She says, well, he might have did a little blow. And he says, well, that sounded like a nice little, little white party. In other words, a drug party. And she says, no, my children were there. And he says, your children? And she turns to him with anger and says, you know, that's effed up, Glass. So then we know we're introduced to his code name as Glass. And he says, well, you know, are they acting, were they acting strange? You know what strange means. And I'm just trying to get whatever information that I need. And Angela inquires if he suffered. And Glass says, yep. <laughs> he gives that very straight to the point, blunt answer. Yep, he suffered. You know, his wrists were broken. He was, he was uh, asphyxiated. Uh, we saw the rope fiber fibers under his nails and he had rope burns on his hands. So yeah, he suffered and he was alive at that time. And as they're talking, she says, well, am I being questioned? You know, why are you investigating me? He says, I'm just trying to get detailed. In other words, telling her, calm down. It's not that serious. And as they're talking and get this guy that lands on <laughs> the hood of the car and he has this weird apparatus on his back that looks like it's some wings so he can take pictures and he has a camera. So we have multiple people, two people that come over these bearings to try to take pictures. And we have another mass cop that just starts to beat him up and smash up the camera. So we know that's a pretty common thing because when it happened, they didn't look too surprised. After they take care of the random paparazzi, people trying to get camera footage and photos and all kind of stuff, Angela says, you know what, well, he's gotta come down because he's still hanging from this tree. So they slowly start to lower his body down from the tree and before he gets completely to the ground, Angela just grabs him and holds him and hugs him as if she's just trying to give him that final goodbye. And when she does that, there's a flashback in her mind of Christmas Eve. She's with her husband, and her husband is watching the clock, waiting for it to get midnight. And she's asking him, why do you keep watching the clock? And he's like, I'm watching it so it can be Christmas Day. And it turns midnight, and he says, well, it's technically Christmas, so I'm opening that box. And she's telling him, well, you know, it's Christmas time when you open up the gifts when it's Christmas morning. You know, everybody knows that. So they're having a nice moment alone, talking about Christmas, slow dancing, and all of a sudden we see intruders come in and they have the Rorschach mask on and they start to attack and shoot while they enter the house. She's able to take down one of them, but the other intruder shoots her with the rifle. So we know that this is the same attack 
that she mentioned in episode one, where she said there was a time where cops' identities were not protected and when cops didn't wear masks. So we know that they found out her location. So we know that that's the, locate, that's the connect of that event. Later on in that moment of that scene of that flashback, she awakens in the hospital and sees that Judd, which she calls Captain at the time, is sitting next to her in a, cap, uh, in a hospital gown as well. And she asks about her husband, you know, where is he? He says that he's okay, but the bad news is that cops were attacked, over 40 houses, and it was clearly a wipeout. And we notice that he looks out kind of like in a distance with pride and calls it uh, the white, what did he call it? Oh, the white knight. And when he says that, he kind of comes back and says, yes, you know, unfortunately, your partner and his wife, they were killed too. And she says, well, you know, we got we to gotta get suited back up and we got to go after them. He says, it's okay to cry. You know, you're not crying. And it's this look of concern. But she tells him that as soon as I get my energy, I'm getting back out there. And if I'm getting back out there, then I know others will want to get back out there. And he tells her, all right, and stop calling me that. Call me Judd. And she tells him, you know, call me Angela. Angela comes back too in present day from that flashback. And they finally zip up the bag in which Judd is in. And there's this one cop that's just so pissed off about the situation. He says, we're all just standing around here. We got the evidence. We're looking around. We got all the pictures that we need. We know that we need to go to a certain location. We need to round up anybody that even might be involved with the supremacy group, with people who might know this information. We need to go there and we need to just round them up. And it's evident that a lot of the other cops are agreeing with this. And they're ready to rock and roll and go ahead and drive to that location. And Angela doesn't think that this is a good approach and it is really not a good way to get information and it's probably impossible to get information. They go to that site, the cop gets on, that has those thoughts, gets on top of the car and he says, well, we know that you know something and we're here and if you don't come out of your residence, we're gonna tear your statue down and it's the statue of Nixon. And as he counts down from three to two to one, somebody throws a bottle at a cop car. And we're like, oh man, it's about to be a riot. It's something about to go on. And the cops go in and start to raid the area and collect everybody, put everybody in handcuffs. And Angela says to Glass, do you really think this is the best approach? And he's puzzled about why Angela would say that because he said, do you not approve of this? Do you not think that this will get done? And as he's asking that, she says, oh, look out. And it's a guy trying to attack him, but she knocks him down and just continues to just rail into his face. And she's oh, so well overwhelmed with anger. She gets back into her car to sit and to breathe because she's so confused about what the heck is going on. But as she's doing that, she looks at her dash and she sees the cup that she took from Will and she remembers, let me go ahead and start on why I got this cup in the first place. Angela goes in regular everyday clothing to the Greenwood Center of Cultural Heritage. And as she's walking up to the building, we do see protesters that are against refredations and they're saying, handouts, handouts, you don't want handouts. And they're shouting out all different kinds of thing, but things, but she walks past them and goes into the building. When she goes into the building, we see these holograms of different memorials, items, and things of either people that fought in the war, black people that fought into the war, or from people who went through the Black Wall Street attacks and they're telling different stories like a museum and people are standing next to them and they're learning and they're hearing their stories. We also see maybe that there's a nice school that's there on the field trip and they're looking at those as well. She goes up to a kiosk and when she goes up to the kiosk, she's looking around hoping that nobody will see her. Angela taps the kiosk screen and a man appears on the screen and says, hello. I am the United States Treasury Secretary, Henry Louis Gates Jr., but you can call me Skip. 
So it's this very welcoming presence that displays on the screen. And he gives a brief history about when Tulsa suffered dramatically and they, they were very prosperous before the attack and so prosperous that it was coined Black Wall Street, which is a true story. You might wanna do some research about that. And it was destroyed all by the KKK, I mean, all in one day, completely destroyed. And he talks about how that's a dark time for humanity and a dark time for the United States and that the government wants to do what it can for the descendants and people who were there um, to go on with their lives as best as possible. And then he says, do you consent to giving us DNA? And Angela says, Yes. And he says, well, please give us a phone number in which you, we can contact you. And she gives a number. He also says that a cotton swab will be given to you at the bottom of this kiosk and swab your DNA. And she swabs the cup that she took from Will. She puts the sample back in the machine. And he says that there are certain requirements to be eligible for, the, for these redfordations. Um, and clearly you have to be a descendant. So she puts that in there and she walks away. Angela comes home after a trying afternoon and sees a man on her porch. And she says, what are you doing here? And he tells her, well, I want to see my daughter. And she tells him, you're not even allowed to be on these premises. What do you want? He says, I want to see, I want to see my child and I want to see her now, but your husband won't let me in. She says, okay, look, just calm down. We'll take a rain check. Can you come later? And he tells Angela, I don't want to take a rain check, but I'll take a check, you know. She gets out her purse and she writes a little something on the check, snatches it off and says, here. And she goes into the house and she sees that her husband and the kids are playing like they're pirates. And they run to Angela saying, mommy. So it's clear as the audience that they really do love her and they see her as the mother. And they're playing pirates. And she said, well, what's going on? And she's telling uh, the mom that we're trying to capture this ghost. And we want to make him walk the plank. And Angela says, well, he's a ghost. And if you put him on the plank, he's not going to sink. He's just going to float off because he's a ghost. Maybe you should use some rocks to weigh him down. So the kids go, yeah, make some rocks. So they take off and being kids and they're probably going somewhere to go in the backyard or something to go get some rocks. And her husband takes off the sheet as he's being a ghost and he sits down with Angela and they look around to make sure that the kids are completely out of the house or out of the room. And he tells her, so the old man that you got, he told you that he did it. So why isn't it being, he being arrested? And she tells him, well, you know, he said that how he was able to hang Judd was Dr. Manhattan helped him. And her husband's like, oh, yeah, well, Dr. Manhattan is on Mars. So, you know, clearly he's crazy. She says, yeah, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to figure out what's going on. I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to Tofu and tell him what happened. She goes up to his room and she, when we, she walks in, he is building this very detailed architectural structure that is just absolutely amazing for a kid his age. And not only is he building this amazing structure, but it's lifted off of the ground and floating because he's clearly using telepathy and some type of power to have it up and floating. And she sits down and she talks to him and says, you know, I'll always be honest with you. And I always want to let you know what's going on, especially when your parents pass. But I'm here to tell you that your uncle Judd, you know, he died. He was, he was murdered. And he looks down and he says, oh, that's just a part of life. Okay. And he says, you know, don't tell Emma and Rosie. Let me do that. Let me tell them the news. And she says, well, okay. And he has this spat of anger. He knocks down the, the architecture that he just built. And all these pieces just fly everywhere. And Angela knows not to have a reaction because that's his way of venting. And she can't even begin to know how he feels. And he asks her, can I watch television? 
She says, yes, baby, you can watch television. And she kisses him on the forehead and she exits, she exits his room, goes downstairs to sit with the dad on the couch. And on the screen, <laughs> we see a title that says American Hero Story. And we hear this announcement that what you're about to view is dangerous, it's emotionally harmful, and in no way, shape, or form is it suitable for children, people of color, individuals of the LBGTQ plus community. There's racism, there's violence, there's and naming all of these crazy, terrible things that's contained in this movie. But the announcement says that the images and the ideas from this movie do not reflect the U.S. government, nor did they reflect the opinions of this network. But what's interesting is it has all of these harmful things, but yet they're playing it. Very interesting. And it has a strong correlation, a strong correlation of the real movie Birth of a Nation, where it depicts the evil KKK as to being the hero. So with this story in the series that they're, that they're going to show is giving the audience the conflict of who's the patriarch and who's the enemy, which is very interesting. If it's so harmful, why would you show it? Ooh, Easter eggs just dropping all over the place. <laughs> we then see a body floating in the water. It's evident there's a you know, a bullet wound in the back of the skull. And we see all these cops, you know, taking pictures and pulling a body out of the water. We hear this raspy, gritty voice over voice that says, that's me, Raph Mueller, floating in the Boston Harbor. But that's not really me. I have to make them think it's me. And I'm thinking, oh, snap. <laughs> this series is speeding up. Oh. And I get really excited as a viewer, like, all right, we starting to learn more people. We starting to bring more people up in this series. Let's go. We cut to this dramatic representation of people at a nice corner store back in the day, and they're getting items, and all of a sudden, a robber comes in and says, give me all your money, and they're robbing everybody, and the people are afraid, and then we see this mask hero come into the store and he has a noose around his neck and he's dressed like a Klansman and his Klansman outfit is red. And we see the anger and we see the fusion in his eyes. So there's this intertwining of helping a robbery, but then you're, the way that you're dressed and your uniform is representing something completely different. Easter egg. But anywho, we hear the voiceover of this person that is this quote unquote hero. And he says, one day I looked into the mirror and I didn't like who I saw. So now I have this new identity and that identity must always be hidden. So we got more clues about more people being introduced into this series. We cut to where Angela, she goes over to Jane's house. You know, she's a widow now as we think. And when she comes in, she has roses in her hand and she's walking very meek and very sad as she makes her way through the crowd. And she says, excuse me, that I wanted to come see you and I just, I wasn't expecting all of these people to be here. She says, no, I really appreciate you being here and it's okay. And as she's speaking with her, a gentleman comes up and he introduces her himself and he's saying that he's Joe Kane and he's a senator and whatever you need and whatever your group needs to find out the details that you need in order to catch who's done this, you have my full support. You have our full support. And she says, well, that's great, but I'm not a cop anymore. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, right. All right. And as she's saying that, as he's talking and as she's listening, she becomes a little, you know, out of it and she faints. So then we see the next scene. She's been placed into the bed and Jane is at her bedside and she awakens Angela and she says, I'm just so sorry. Here I am trying to take care of you and you're taking care of me. And Jane says, no, just rest. Get your rest. It's okay. And she gives her a drink of water. She says, well, let me go back out to everybody else and talk and I don't you know I don't want to be rude and she goes okay she says get rested and Angela's in the bed 
and she's still acting sort of faint out of it. Then she opens her eyes again, and it was all an act. Her faint was all an act. She gets up and she goes to the closet and she puts on these goggles. Easter egg! She puts on these goggles and she cuts them on. And there are these red owl-shaped goggles that she puts on. And while she's in the closet, this apparatus that she has allows her to see through all of the walls in the closet. She's searching for some type of information and as she's looking there is this big gap in the closet to where she just sees the silhouette of a head and she's like well i gotta see what this is you know and she's feeling around within the closet trying to find if there's a secret latch and she's looking and she finds a secret latch and she unhooks it and there is this secret cabinet that opens and when it opens there is this cinematic shot shot showing the essence of something white. And as she backs up even further, she looks and it is an old KKK uniform. And she is just in shock and in amazement of what is this? And is it what I think it is? Because it has the old badge. And if you notice that badge, a little side note, is the same badge of police officers. And police officers, when they evolved, they were slave catchers. They weren't police officers that protected the people, they were slave catchers. That was their job. Until this day, the cops have the same badge that has been yet to be redesigned. Isn't that something? Moving on. Then cut to the weird gentleman that we met in the first episode. And he looks like he's in Ireland or somewhere. And he's on his horse again. Easter egg. He's on the horse going through the hill. And he goes to a tree and he pulls off a tomato. And it looks like it's in its prime of being ripe. And he takes a bite of the tomato. And then he squishes it and just lets all the juice out. And he just looks like he's just so just comforted and just happy of something that has happened. He heads back into the castle or the villa and he sits down and he has a cake in front of him with two candles and they're celebrating the two assistants that he had, the male and the female, and they're singing, for he's the jolly good fellow. And he's like, yeah, 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 hurry up and get to it. And he's like, uh, for he's the jolly good fellow, but nobody can deny. He wants them to hurry up. And they're saying, yes, we're just, we're just excited for you. And he says, to the woman assistant tonight when you perform real tears, okay? Real tears. And she says, yes, I'll make sure that I shed real tears. And the male assistant says, master, um, for props, may I use your watch? And he says, one thing you don't understand is that you are the prop. And he's confused. I'm like, yes, master. Like, okay. And he hands him the watch to use as a prop. See that they're putting on a play. These two assistants are putting on a play, reenacting the accident that happened to the character, John Osterman. And he's talking to a woman and she says, oh, I have forgotten my watch. And he says, oh, look, it appears that I have left my watch in the intrinsic. And, and the guy's like, oh, the intrinsic field generator. He's like, yes. The intrinsic field generator. I must get it. And he goes into it. And as he walks into it to get the watch, they reenact the door closing. And all of a sudden, we see these flames begin. And we're like, is he getting burned up for real? Or is this, this is some good homemade, you know, special effects? And you're thinking, man, he has to be burned alive. Or maybe he got out in the back. The viewers don't know what's going on. And then we see the male, the, the female assistant, she gets in front of the prop and says, oh, my John. And we see some tears starting to form and the guy's viewing the play like, yes, 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 tears. And she's, what will I do, my, my poor John? And she's really finally pulling out some tears. And all of a sudden, we see this image of a man completely nude. He's blue all over and he has this mask with the initial symbolism on the forehead, for those of you that don't know what this is, it's okay, that's coming up. So he comes down 
and he's being brought down completely nude and he says, I am John. I am not John. I am Dr. Manhattan. And the guy that wrote the play, he's sitting there like, just, just totally engulfed in what just happened. And they end the play and he's just, yes. <laughs> but we notice throughout the play, there are assistants that are masked. You know, they have masks on their face, black mask, and one's playing the violin and playing the drum and the other one is helping with all the props. And after they have a successful show, they start to take off their mask and we see that they are clones of each other. And he says, wonderful job, you guys worked as a team, the play was beautiful. And they're saying, yes, master, we're happy that you liked it and we really, really did our best. And he says, well, you know, do something with that one. And they open up the door and it is the body completely burned up. I mean, and he says, master, should we put this one well down with the others? And he says, yes, go ahead and get rid of them. Bo, but first, and he goes into the burned hand and he breaks it and pops it open and he gets his watch. And he says, well, would you like to be the new Mr. Phillips to one of the clones? And he says, yes, master, I would love to be, <laughs> you know? So they're continuously evolving as Mr. Phillips, being that, that assistant or clone that's closer to this gentleman of who we haven't learned of yet. So we see that that's what they are. They are clones of some sort. And he looks at the watch to see if it's working. And he gives it a thump. The watch still works. Angela goes back to the bakery. And when she gets to the bakery, she sees that Will has made himself right on at home. He's taken off that handcuff and he's still in there. He's been in there all day. But she sees him cooking and there's some stuff on the stove and she says well what are you doing and, and where did you get this stuff from he says i went to the market you know he like i got some supplies i don't know basically i don't know where you went so i went to get some food and he goes and he's making boiled eggs and when he's making boiled eggs he's looking at her and she's like what did you do what did you do and and i saw what you meant and i found something in their closet and he says well what did you find and she pulls out the, the KKK, you know, uniform that she saw in the closet. And she slams it down and she says, did you put that there? And he says, it's hard for me to do in a wheelchair. And was it upstairs? And if it was upstairs, how did, how did I get up there? And she says, well, you're claiming you hung somebody from a tree. So you, you could have easily went upstairs. And he's just looking at her like, oh, interesting. And he has a clock, a timer that's on the stove. And it's ticking, ticking closer to a particular time. And as he's waiting on that timer to go off, he goes into the pot of boiling water and goes in and gets the egg, the boiled egg, and starts to peel off the shell. Like the water didn't even burn him. And he says, hmm, it's very interesting. He's peeling it off and he's eating that egg. And he says, I told you that there was some information that you didn't know. And he has some skeletons in his closet. And before she can answer, the phone ring, the timer goes off and then the phone rings. And he's looking at her like, you know, better answer it. She answers the phone and it is the message from the Heritage Center that she went to earlier in the episode. And it says, hi, Will, you are eligible for red predations. And it says that you have basically two descendants of this person. And are there any other names that you want to know about that maybe we have on file? And she says, Angela Abar. And he says, oh, yes, Will. Um, Will is Angela Abar's grandfather. And then it hits her and she looks at him and he's just sitting there like, did you get some good news? And she hangs up the phone. She says, well, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're trying to set up that family. You're trying to set up judge. She's in complete denial about what she's just seen. I don't know how much more evidence that she needs, but she's conflicted with what she knows as Judd and the information that she's developed and grown with the family as friends that she's in denial. And she says, you know, you are under arrest. And she proceeds to handcuff him and get him in that wheelchair. And she's taking him to a van. She goes to slowly put him in the van. And when she does that, she tries to go under his arms to lift him. And when she does that, 
it turns into a brief hug. And you can tell that it's not awkward because she feels some sort of intimacy, some sort of connection when she gives him this hug. She kind of gets out of that thought and continues to lift him and put him into the seat in the vehicle and she closes the door. And as she's turning to put the wheelchair into the vehicle, we then see this ship, this spaceship that comes out of the sky. There's a huge magnet that goes on top of the vehicle and it lifts up the van. And Angela's just, Angela's just looking at it like, what is going on? And as it's lifting, Will looks in the mirror, the side mirror, mirror looking down at Angela and he gives her that look like, and it proceeds to lift off and go away. And Angela's looking into the sky like, oh, and she's terrified, like, this old man ain't crazy. It really is some stuff going on. And as he's being lifted up, that piece of paper that he got from his father when he was fighting in World War II drops down and floats down. And she gets it and she looks at it and she starts to read it. And by that time, the vehicle's almost gone and it's just vanished. And she literally says, what the? <laughs> and that is the end of the episode what an amazing episode this series is about to be off the chain i am so excited about this series i have a foreshadowing idea that her husband is working with the cops in a bad way or working with the bad guys in a bad way because every event so far he's not harmed or touched the white knight, he was, wasn't harmed or wasn't touched. Um, another situation where he's always questioning her about, well, what happened with this and where did this go? So, and then also when he's playing with the children and he's dressed as the ghost, he's in a white sheet. So I think that is foreshadowing symbolism of who her husband really is. Hmm, think about that. Now I have to say, for many people that were on the internet, people that were on YouTube saying this series looks like it's trash and it's a waste and this is that, I really think those are the individuals that were not clear-minded about what this series is trying to do. This is a different interpretation, okay? When you look at franchises, when you've read a book and things have been translated to that director and to those writers' way of depicting certain things, you can't compare them. It's hard not, not to because you're always going to compare Heath Ledger to Mr. Phoenix, right? But you have to view things differently. You have to be open-minded in what they're trying to do. And I think a lot of reviewers not really being open-minded to what's going on. They said it was terrible. They said it was, oh, this is trash. Why are people watching this? And a lot of people on YouTube repeat those statements because they don't want to view it themselves. They don't want to gain their own opinion. So for clickbait and popularity, they'll say the same things. I wonder what their opinions are now that they've seen Episode two, from the beginning, I've said, I'm going to give this a chance being the comic book reader, even though I've seen the movie, I'm going to give this series a chance. When you look at the cast, it's a very well picked, selected cast. These are seasoned, crisp thespians and actors. Okay, so it's not going to be what you think it is. If you do research about the writers, the creators, the designers, the script writers, Kind of inevitable is inevitable is gonna be the bomb.com. So let me just say that and get that out of the way. Let me know what you think about this episode. Now, to get to the title about what it means is a totally different video. I mean, we could go outside of this episode and get really deep into what it means. But when you talk about feats, understanding the word feet, feet is uh, being a very uh, dominant craft or skill or something that you've developed that which which took a lot of uh, pride and acknowledgement to learn, right? Um, and it, it takes great skill uh, and there's pride in that. So when we think the martial feats of the, uh, the, the Comanche horsemanship, 
What that is, is two things. It is literally from a painting, okay? Um, and let me read this because I wanna make sure it's accurate, okay? And not what I think or what you think I think, okay? Now, um, this is a real painting by George, uh, what'd you say, Cat Caitlin? Um, uh, from 1834, they estimate between 1834 and 1835. Um, and with that painting, people can still argue that the gentleman that did that painting, he used, he was just so engulfed and intrigued, per se, about Native Americans. It was more an insult than anything, but he was just so odd about how he would see the Native people get on the horse going at full speed. And as they went full speed, they had this skill, okay, this feat skill of leaning halfway off of the horse and having complete control and no fear that they would fall off of this horse. Do an attack, okay? And then come back up upright on a horse. So that is why it is the martial feats of the Comanche horsemanship, that is true horsemanship. And the fact that they had that painting in that household says a lot. The Easter eggs throughout this episode says so much. Now we're learning who are the true heroes, who are the true patriarchs, who are the real enemies. We're starting to learn that. So many references in this episode. Like I said, that can be a totally different episode. I don't want to say too much and give it away for those who are newbies. But I do have complete faith that they will go more into detail about a lot of things as it goes along. I will say as a viewer, I do love the fact that they're taking their time. Because that's how you pull viewers. That is how you get people to think for themselves and learn for them, themselves. It's intrigued people doing research about things that have happened in real life in, Amer in America. It's intrigued so many people to go back and read the comments and go back and look at the movie and have fun with researching and comparing all three platforms, the comic book, the movie, and this series. So I love how it challenges us to think because a lot of series don't challenge us on that and they just just flood us with all this information so we have a total of nine episodes for this series and nine episodes is pretty short so it's the complete confidence that we'll know we we know <laughs> that you'll be back for season two we know that you will crave and want more so it's that confidence in that HBO special. Like, we know, boo-boo, that it's going to be a season two, okay? <laughs> so let me go ahead and get me a Watchmen t-shirt <laughs> ASAP. And I hate that Halloween is around the corner because I surely would have rocked that Watchmen outfit that Regina King had on because it's pretty bad. I mean, not bad as in bad, but it's badass. That's what I mean. I didn't mean to curse. But let me know what you think about this episode. I thought it was the bomb. And I'm so excited for, for, for episode three. Make sure to follow me. I'm not a good rapper. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. Also check out my new podcast show. I did place the link below so you can look at it. It is the podcast show entitled The Bunny Show. It's also on Spotify and the Google platform, uh, but it has been translated into video form. The first episode, the premiere episode is called Your Soul Not Okay. It's talking about mental health and differentiating what changes you can make in your life and understanding social media's presence in your life and what to do to regain yourself and if you're not yourself, understanding that you're not okay, understand the truth first and then move forward. And you can let me know your comments about that too. Can't wait to read your comments. And I know a lot of you are going to say, did you know? Da, 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 da. I, we know, okay? We try to keep it straight to the simple where we talk about the, just the episode as much as possible and speak about the references in minimal form, okay? <laughs> See you guys next week. Talk to you later. Bye.